Thank you for the nice invitation. It's great to be here at KITP. Um, we're trying to build uh, quantum computers, quantum simulators, and it's really nice that we can abstract away the concept of a qubit. And uh, think about that, think about it theoretically, but as uh, Rolf Landauer said, all information is physical, and especially quantum bits which are susceptible to noise, fundamentally susceptible to noise. And maybe in some distant future we'll have perfect qubits, but if we're talking about any real systems right now, we have to think about noise. And that's what I want to focus on my talk today. And first I want to talk about if we're trying to build powerful quantum computers and quantum simulators, we have to talk about noise because they're limiting the performance of that. Uh, I want to then talk a little bit about noise methodology, metrology, to figure out how do we really characterize this so we can at least compare, you know, qubits and understand what we're doing. And also I want to uh, maybe apologize a little bit for my insistence about thinking about noise. I come from the John Clark Lab in Berkeley where basically you can sum up a lot of what John did was that noise is the signal. And to me, you know, understanding the noise of these real experimental systems is a big signal just by itself that we have to understand. And I'll just try to, you know, give an overview and explain why I think that's so important. Um, so let's talk about that. I have a very interesting statement here, and I'm going to conjecture state that the majority of the talks that I hear, maybe we're going to hear in this conference, I don't know, uh, do not discuss noise, at least at a very deep level. And that's okay, because we're trying to understand what's going on, but, you know, if this is a NISC conference, we should be talking about noise to some degree, okay? So why not? Well, you know, the physics of these systems, even though they're, they're noisy, are interesting by themselves. And you can understand a lot without doing it, fine. And for example, if you want to look at phase transitions, you don't necessarily have to understand all the imperfections to do that. Yeah, fair enough. And okay, publish nice papers, we're doing something new, that's great. But why do we want to specify noise? First of all, if you're going to do an experiment, you have to traditionally talk about the errors of the experiment. That's fundamental to an experiment. And, uh, you know, for one, to reproduce the experiment, but also to just to understand your claims. And we're building computational devices, and I'm going to show that noise really matters. Okay, we need to talk about it. We're going to ask the question, are we really doing something powerful in these? And obviously now we're at the beginning of the field, building quantum computers. You know, just to demonstrate something is interesting, but at the end we want to do something powerful that we can't do with a classical computer. And you need to understand noise to understand that point. Uh, these are programmable machines. Okay? How do we know, how well do we know the parameters? So that has to do with noise. Uh, and if we want to, you think about future computers, error correction, we'll have to talk later on about that. That's going to be limited by noise. You need to budget it, understand that. And finally, for me, if we want to make real quantum computers and do something powerful, we have to fix our noise problem. They aren't, all qubits are not good enough. And if you talk about noise and you show that it's important, I'm just going to say that the students will see it's important, people will do noise experiments, try to improve the qubits, and we're all going to benefit. If you don't talk about noise, no one's going to fix it. So this is important for the future of our field, in, in my view, okay? So I'm going to first conjecture something, and please, I'd love to have discussions with people to define this better. But I'm just trying to bring out a point here. Now, there's a nice paper uh, talk here on Tuesday, Qubit Efficient Simulation of Quantum Tensor Networks. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the original reference published a few years ago. But basically, when you use approximations using quantum tensor networks and do that well, it's efficiently simulatable. 
but you introduce errors, you know, one or two percent or so introduced by those approximations, but you can simulate it efficiently with a classical computer. So I'm, from that basic idea, I'm going to propose, I'm going to conjecture a theorem called the NIST threshold. Quantum computers and simulators can be efficiently simulated with errors, approximately a few percent. Hardware should be below that threshold in the sense that if you have hardware that's two, three, four percent, you might as well simulate it with these approximate methods because they're just going to give you an equivalently good result. So why, why are you, it's just, is it meaningful to build a quantum computer with a few percent errors? That's my question and conjecture. Is there a threshold for building say? So please talk to me. I'd love to know if this is true or not. So, you know, maybe a corollary a little bit stronger. Quantum advantage can't be claimed without error measurements or, you know, with high error. Right? That's why I want to know the error of a quantum computer. I want to know, are you really doing something computationally complex? Again, it's, it's a conjecture. I'd love to talk about it. Now what's, and then of course, you know, classical computation methods are getting much better over time, so this might be a moving threshold, okay? People are doing better. Okay, so that's the, that's the first idea. Um, the second idea is, look, we want to run algorithms, we want to show a quantum advantage or quantum supremacy, something you can't do classically, okay? And I'm going to say, it's for an experiment, it's difficult to prove a quantum advantage, uh, even if the paper can't uh, compute results with classical simulation. So you do an experiment, you get some results, you say, we, you know, 50 or more, more qubits, got quantum advantage. It's really hard to prove that you've got quantum advantage, okay? You're, you're, you're kind of trying to prove a negative. It's, it's really hard to prove. So, uh, you know, so people, you know, they, they tried some classical simulation. How complete is it? Did they try all the latest methods and algorithms like this tensor uh, matrix product states? Uh, does it some kind of approximation or scaling methods give at least a semi-qualitative or even semi-quantitative answer? Okay? And finally, there's, a, there's an interesting psychological component to it, is you do this really hard experiment. Do the theorists really want to say, well, if I do this simulation, I can kind of, you know, predict your data. Okay, your collaborators kind of don't want to negate your experiment by doing that. So they're going to look hard, but maybe, and that's what's good about publishing. You publish it, and then people, you know, try to, try to figure that out. And then, now, some of these uh, quantum calculations, quantum simulation, can be proved difficult or at least motivated, so that's okay. So anyway, the basic issues here, it's difficult to prove classical computation is hard, and then what constitutes useful computation, especially without knowing your errors. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hard problem, and, you know, maybe can't be addressed right now really well, but it's something we should think about. Now, one of the things that, you know, we have done, done in the experiments is use classical error probability to um, describe quantum errors. So you say, I have a certain quantum operation, and there's a certain probability that I had an error, and you describe it in terms of poly errors. You know, you can justify doing that. It's not necessarily fully correct, but it's actually a really good way to do it, especially given the fact that a lot of noisy discussions and, and experiments discussing noise has not been really complete. So it's a good way to start here. So, uh, you know, of course, quantum computation is amplitudes, formerly in quantum tomography, but classical error probability is pretty good. So error probability is simple to, to understand and use and can give, you know, you, you budget your errors and you can figure out that. Uh, and it's easier to measure and predict, especially when you have a large system. So why does it work well? Well, first of all, it's your first order estimate. It might not be perfect, but you know, it's a good way to start. Okay? And the algorithms can be used to randomize the state in some way, 
Uh, for example, even if it was a, a normal algorithm, you can do randomized compiling, uh, and, uh, and it's a good way to do it. One of the interesting things I would say here is that when you have, this maybe you don't understand, when you have a qubit, idling it, doing nothing to it, is generally the noisiest operation you can often do to it. If you do something like spin echo or dynamically decoupling, you tend to get rid of some correlated noise sources, which is good. Uh, and then algorithms without randomization, more sensitive calibration. So it, this, is a, this is a good thing. Uh, and then, you know, we'll talk about the quantum supremacy experiment. This kind of idea is validated. So, you know, although there's details here, the important thing in my mind is if you do an experiment, at least measure the classical, classical-like error probabilities of the gate, gates and see if the end result makes sense. Okay, that's what I'm really trying to get here. And there's details, and it may not always work, and that's fine. But, you know, we, we, need to, we need to start predicting what the performance of complex algorithms do using this. Okay, so I want to, taking that concept of just some error probability, I want to talk a little bit about where the field is right now, in my view. Okay, again, it's not... I think, I think it's directionally accurate of what we want to do here. So just to give us an analogy to understand what I'm talking about here, let's take a classical circuit, and you know that if you have an errors in, let's say, manufacturing this circuit, the number of gates, the number of logic gates basically goes as one over the error, the probability error of, of have, making a transistor badly. Okay, in 1960s, you can make maybe a thousand, uh, the error rate of making a transistor properly was a part in a thousand, so you could make 100 to 1,000 gate circuits, and you have TTL, and you could build stuff out of it. Nowadays, that error rate is maybe 10 to minus 11, and you can build huge, you know, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 transistor processors to do something. Now, in quantum, it's a similar kind of, of thing, except instead of worrying so much about building the transistors and their errors, you're more worried about the intrinsic errors in the gates of it. You know, building is hard enough, but it's, you're more limited by the performance, the quantum performance of the gate. So you take a W qubits, and you take uh, uh, instructions, so depth one, two, three, four, five instructions, and the num total number of instructions is W times D. And using this kind of uh, logic here, it W times D goes as one over the air to gate. And it's more or less coherence time over gate time. Anyway, let's plug in numbers. So a 100 qubit device is supposed to be really great right now. OK. If you have an error of 10 to the minus 2, it's typical of what people are doing. What's your depth? Your depth is one instruction set. Now, maybe you can push that out to three or five or maybe even ten. But if people are, all does talk about building 100 qubit systems. If your error is 1%, then you can just do a few instructions. What does that mean? That means these quantum computers are kind of useless. Maybe you can do some experiments, have some small. Now, if you had an error of 10 minus 4, which is no one's doing right now for all the gates you need to do, then your depth is 100, and then you've got something that's interesting, and you can really start doing something, okay? So, you know, it's, we really need to do that. And just to, you know, here was from the Rigetti SPAC at the beginning of the year, kind of talking about different commercial efforts, but errors are in the few percent Google's a little bit better. I think this number is a little bit low. But anyway, a few percent, OK? So you know, these numbers are not that great. That's where we are. The field is not going to do very well if we continue with these errors. We really want to point that out. Now, be aware there's a lot of fake news out there. You'll see best results. You'll see results of two qubit gates just for two qubits instead of a big system. That's not good. Okay. Now, 
let's talk about kind of the overall strategy of measuring and checking your errors. And this is kind of, I think it was, would be a gold standard of what you want to do. Now, this is the problem. You have the circuit model, you break it up into infill gates that you do on qubits over time. That's great. But if you measure an error on one qubit or pair of qubits at one time, how do you know that when you put it together, it's going to work properly? Okay, that's what happens in our computer, but there's no guarantee when you build a qubit system that's going to happen. And basically, you can just say there's crosstalk, right? So you operate on one qubit and it screws up one next to it, or there's some reflection in the line, so you use something in one time step and it has some effect on the other. Okay, so crosstalk is the big issue. And if you don't talk about crosstalk in a real system, you're not talking about real physical qubits unless you show that it doesn't matter, okay? You need to show that, right? So, you know, okay, you can check single qubit gates with tomography, make sure it's, the quantum nature is right. That's really important to do. Uh, two qubit gates, same thing. But then you want to start talking about, well, what happens in time? And what's really great about um, like randomized benchmarking or cross entropy benchmarking is that you're doing gates in time, and then you see if one time affects the other one in some way. Okay? And basically what you do is you just re repeat some operations in time and you just see see what happens, see if you can make sense of it. Variety of ways to do that. You can also build a large processor and then just do the same thing on individual gates, right? You want to see in a big processor, is these kind of measurements making sense? And then you can also do pairs of, of qubits, for example, all around a big array and see if there's any space crosstalk. One qubit or one qubit pair is affecting other ones, okay? And then you can run a full complex algorithm and test everything. And there's no guarantee, as an experimentalist, when you build a system, everything's going to work right. You don't know. You have to test it. You know, abstractly, you expect it to work. But this is nature. There's no guarantee that will work. And then, of course, what you do is you take data in all these different ways, and you compare the models, and you see if it is consistent. Okay. So, um, I, I, I'll talk about in specifically what I like, I think the right way to do this, might be many other ways, but the right way to do it is cross-entropy benchmarking. So you start with quantum state and process tomography on a single gate, and you know, that's really great, but it scales badly as to, it, it, you, can, you can't do it beyond a few qubits. And again, you want to know what happens when you do multiple gates. So the p thing that people have done for years is randomized be benchmarking. And what's nice is you increase the error by doing it many times. You subtract away the state preparation and measurement because uh, you're just looking at what happens as you change this. Well, one of the things that's not so great about this randomized benchmarking is you're using Clifford gates. And Clifford's greats are nice because you can approve theorems about it. However, you're building a real analog system, and your gates are not a perfect Clifford. Okay? And okay, that adds to the error budget, but, you know, fundamentally it's not. So what happens with cross-entry benchmarking is very similar to randomized benchmarking, but it can be if applicable for an arbitrary gate. And basically what you do is you find the best fit description of what that unitary is and plus an error. And you analyze the, the model that way. And that way you know, you measure exactly what your gate's doing. And it could be a little bit off from a Clifford, and then you'll measure that, and then you know that you have to tune up your calibration, for example, to make it better. And this works up to about 30, maybe 50 qubits or more, like the quantum supremacy experiment, and, uh, you know, and again, predicts performance with error probability, which is, you know, fine to, to start with. So now I want to talk about the quantum supremacy experiment and show you how we did the error budgeting. Okay, so we have a big chip here, 53 qubits. 
And what we start out by looking at individual qubits, we turn off the couplers, detune all the other qubits, figure out how good that qubit is, and then we do that individually over all the 53 qubits, and we get an integrated histogram given by this in the dotted line here. And, you know, it's more or less a kind of a, a Gaussian kind of curve. There's a little bit of tail here at worst errors. Uh, and you can get uh, an average error of about 0.15%. Okay? Now, that's not how this computer works, right? All the tra transistors here are all, you know, firing at once. So you then do a simultaneous measurement where we turn off the couplers and then do all 53 qubits at the same time and do randomized benchmarking. And that's hard because if you get some crosstalk and other problems, it's going to screw it up. And yeah, it does get worse. That's the black line. And then you see it's a little bit worse, but not too much. Okay, you know, you expect a little bit of problems, but that's a good sign. It's not good. Now you can do the same thing with two qubits. Now what I want to do here is what happens with two qubits, you do both single qubit gates and two qubit gates, you subtract away the errors from the single qubit gates, and you can get the two qubit error. And this is where there's isolated two qubits. One over here, then one over here. You do that, all the possible combinations. And you see there it's about 0.36%. Now this error is more or less twice the single qubit error, a little bit more. And you would expect it to be twice as bad because there's two qubits on it. So it's twice as easy, a little bit more because of complex gate. But now then you do it in simultaneous and you're doing pairs all over to here. And instead of being here, it's here at this uh, green line right here. So it didn't quite go up a factor or two. And that's telling you you have crosstalk. That's telling you you have problems. And you have to fix that. Okay, and then how to fix it is hard, and you, you know, spend a lot of time on it. But this, this tells you that, okay, you know, there, there's some things you have to, you have to fix here. Okay. So you can do the same thing for readout. It's not too big of a, a thing. But doing this, this simultaneous is really important. Now you want to ask, what happens when you run this algorithm over the whole array? Right? That's the next level. Not just single and two qubit by itself or simultaneous, but how running the whole array. And in fact, very few people, you know, realize that, but that's what the quantum supremacy experiment was all about for me. I wanted to know if you build a big circuit, is errors going to go all to hell? Because they could. You don't know. And that was the test. So tested the general purpose circuit, randomly chosen gates as, as these randomized benchmarking kind of things go. You get qubit speckle, very much like laser speckle. And what you do is you run the experiment to get the output states. Then you run it through a simulator where you get the probability of all those states. For the states you measure, you put in probability. If the probability is just random one over two to the n, then the fidelity is zero. But of course, you're, there, there's different probabilities for the states. You're going to measure the brighter ones. And if it's perfect, you get a fidelity of one. And what's nice about this, thank you, is that if you have one error anywhere in the circuit, you had a bit flip or phase flip here. And that could be due to the circuit or you screwing up in, you know, writing your whole program, then that randomizes this laser speckle, decorrelates it, and you get a fidelity of zero. So basically this fidelity is telling you what's the probability that you had zero errors in the whole circuit. And that's what you want to know. You want to know, did, you, did, did it make a thing? And, and is the probability any worse? So it, it's, it's good for, it's good for doing that. So, okay, quantum supremacy data. People have seen this before. Uh, the red is the full circuit. That's what we measured. Uh, and then, uh, at the end here, although this is laptop and workstation, at the end here is a big data center. 
And, uh, but what I really want to focus on here is this black line. And the black line is the prediction from the gate and measurement errors. And since it draw, lies on top of the red circles, it means there are no additional errors. That's really good news. I'm totally shocked that this is the way it worked. Okay, but in, for once in my life, the experiment kind of worked as well as I hoped. So that's great. So uh, the prediction of the fidelity is just a classical probability prediction. The fidelity is the, uh, the fidelity of each of the individual operations that we already measured. Okay, and then uh, that, uh, that worked. And this is nice because it basically says, you know, for these complex circuits, the, this kind of thing works, as long as, you know, the, your, your system is designed right. It's also interesting that this fidelity did not depend on the degree of entanglement. It's working on a very large Hilbert space. But the other thing I want to talk about here is this measurement actually allows you to look inside of your algorithm and for each gate at a specific point in time, you can figure out that you can understand what that gate is doing. And this is an example of what's going on. This is for like 25, 27 qubits. Fidelity is about 2.5%. We, we get that. But we put in a phase flip error. Okay? And the phase flip error of this then goes to zero. Okay? Which is, I said, what it should do. If you put a bit flip face, it goes zero. And then if you just vary that, this is in the theoretical simulation, you see both the data and the experiment goes as a, this cosine squared, which is exactly the kind of error you would expect for like a single qubit. If you, were, you have an error in a single qubit. But this is for an error that's way buried in the, in the middle of the, of the algorithm. And what's nice is that you can see that the circuits are a little bit shifted right of this. And it basically means for that gate, the calibration was a little bit off. And what it means is you could go into the whole algorithm at each gate at each time and do this kind of experiment and figure out, you know, what detail is going on with, with that circuit there. And, you know, if there, there might be some residual crosstalk errors that are very small. So you can test each gate. In, in space and time, about 500, and learn information from that. That's pretty cool. I'm just going to summarize now. Um, I'm going to say uh, if uh, we first have to get our errors less than about 1 or 2 percent, and I'm conjecturing we need to do that so that there's no efficient classical simulation of yours. Again, that has to be, it's a conjecture, it has to be proven. And then I'm also saying you need errors less than about 0.1% so that uh, we can do deep enough and wide enough algorithms to do something useful, okay? And I would say the field is not there. That's likely true, that's what we need to do. And the field's not there, and that's something we have to really work on to make better experiments. And then I'm going to also say it's very important for all of these experiments to measure the system errors compared to an error budget. And even if you're just doing probabilistic comparison to errors, that's not maybe the full thing you have to do, but it's very useful. And it's probably good enough. And I really like to say that XCB is a good way to do that. And again, more investigation of errors, more understanding of that, I think, is something that's really important for the field, and especially a lot of effort to reduce the errors, which I know people are doing, but that's very, very important for the future of this field. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question about this comparison with classical errors, the slide that you have. Um, I guess these CPUs these days, they have like close to 10 billion transistors, and then that error rate that you have, if I just take the product, it seems like... Just, just a second. So um, you're going back to this? No, no, the, the earlier slides when you had classical error rates versus quantum error rates, like classical CPUs, I guess. Oh, very well. Yeah, here, uh, M1 and TTO. 
This one? No, next next one, I think. Next one? Um, ah, yes, that one. Okay. Here, so I, I guess I have 10 billion transistors in my M1 CPU, and then if I just take the product, it seems like my depth should be 10. So what's going on? Why why classical machines work? Because they, are, they also, I don't think, use error correction there. It's just some server memories that use error correction. So, right? so of course, in the end, we're never going to get here with qubits, and then you have to do error correction, right? Is that uh, no? But what I'm saying is that I, I, it, look, it's very hard for me. I have a really bad hearing, uh -huh. and uh, the speaking through a mask makes it really hard. So if you uh, can just unmask, that will help me. Is that better now? Yes. Okay. What I'm saying is that. Um, that based on this logic, if I just take that number and multiply it by the number of transistors in my CPU, it seems like the depth that I should be getting in my classical computer is 10. But certainly that's not the case. So I'm trying to understand how does this yeah, logic yeah, work. Yeah, the, the problem is, uh, as, I, as, I know, as I noted here, is this is in space and this is in time. So you can't, it, it's only an analogy. You can't make a direct comparison. Thanks. But, but uh, um, you know, yeah, in, what happens is in classical circuits, it ten, your, it ter, your errors tend to be in the fabrication, but not in the operation. Okay. Whereas here, you know, fabrication matters, but it's mostly in the time operation. Thank you. There was one back there. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? You're going to have to take off your mask for me to understand, to have a chance to understand you. Well, I, I just took it off. Yeah, I think that might be better. But, um, you can also come up here. Just come up here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just can't. My hearing is terrible. Um, so, you talked a lot about characterizing gate errors. Um, you didn't mention TLS at all, or T1 and T2. I was wondering if you have any ideas about what TLS is and how to reduce it. Yeah, so um, I, I gave a very abstract uh, uh, view of, of uh, measuring that. And I think people are pretty good with measuring T1 and T2, and I consider that to be kind of at this level right here. And what you want to do is compare these measurements are XEB and whatever to uh, you know those 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 measurements. And you know that that's great. I'm really trying to emphasize here. But I think people are doing a pretty good job here. The fact that they need to go down. Uh, you know, down here on a large processor and, and moving it that way. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. Now, in terms of your, your TLSs and the like, that degrades your, your qubits, just like the T1 and T2 does, and you have to do careful error budgeting of that. But those kind of problems tend to get put into these gates uh, the, the fidelity and the errors of these gates. So it's kind of included there. And in fact, when I, I showed you uh, this data right here and talked about, you know, these, you know, this green line simultaneously being right to uh, this line, yeah, TLSs could, could be, uh, could be, uh, one of the things that are doing that. And I think Kevin could probably speak to that more more in detail now, but you certainly have to put all that into your error models. Emphasize the importance of focusing on noise, uh, but how, do you have any thoughts on how we're going to reduce noise by a factor of 10? I, I, I can't understand you, okay. I'm sorry. You, you focused on, you, you emphasize the importance of focusing on noise. Yeah. Uh, what do you think are the approaches that we're going to take to bring this down by a factor of 10 to 100? Is it doing more of the same better, or is it going to require fundamentally new ideas for how to build qubits? Um, yeah, so 
Thank you. That's a great question. How can we reduce the errors by a factor of 10 or 100? Uh, mostly, you know, people know they have to do that. And mostly what I'm trying to do in this talk is to motivate people to really work hard and motivate graduate students and other young people that it's way more important for the field to decrease the error than to use for you to run another algorithm and publish it in Nature. Okay, the Nature articles are great. They're good for your career. It's exciting. But what is going to keep everyone here employed that you worry about is making the qubits better. And that's, in, in a nutshell, kind of what I'm talking about. Now, can we do it? I think it can be done with, uh, with, uh, the, the, with transmons, the sycamore architecture, whatever. They, we just need to get the, uh, the qubit coherence up and solve other problems, too. I think it can be done. I think, you know, we'll have to see with other qubits. I don't know enough about them. It's possible. It's a matter of focus and um, people really working on the hard problems, really hard problems. It's very hard to get promoted, become a faculty member if you improve the qubit a little bit. Please, let's stop, let's, you know, let's really value people who are fixing those hard problems, please. That's how, that's how we're gonna make progress in this field. Yeah. Yeah, considering that you can have crosstalk between qubits that are even far away from each other, um, what are your thoughts about how a modular architecture would look like for superconducting qubits in terms of the size of the modules? Uh, yeah, um, um, you have to worry about crosstalk across the whole chip. Generally, it's a little bit more of a problem when they're next to each other. One of the reasons why you can deal with crosstalk a little bit better is um, because you can tune the qubits at different frequencies. Kevin has you know, worked very hard on this. You can talk to him. Uh, but I, I think that's, a, that's a, you know, a problem that you really, really have to deal with. And I was just at a conference last week, and they were talking about you know, how ion traps is really great because all the qubits are the same. But it also means that all the qubits are susceptible to crosstalk with each other. And, and I just think this is a, an issue that has to be dealt with and engineered and understood better. Um, and was how large do you envision a module to be in a modular architecture, assuming that that's the direction that you would go down? I think you can build uh, modules of 20,000 qubits and then tile them together. So you, we have a long way to go, but it makes no sense to do that until the qubits are better. And you know, and then you have to understand the fundamental physics of like where are all the errors coming from. Again, that, I, I, you know, that, that's what we, we really need to do. Uh, hi. So thanks for your talk. Um, I'm curious, uh, there have been a, a couple of works published over the last couple of years uh, that talk about integrating noise into algorithm design as sort of a useful resource. Uh, I'm kind of curious if you have, I mean, that's not to say we don't need to obviate noise, but I'm curious if you have an idea about how that could be best leveraged. Um. Uh, I, I haven't read any of the papers saying that noise is good, okay? Um, I imagine in a certain sense it could be, but uh, yeah, that, I, 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 don't, I don't know about that work and, and that, that surprises me. Um, it could be that certain kind of noise is good or you can, certain kind of noise is correlated and then you can do things to get rid of it. But uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to talk to you or anyone else 
to, to hear those arguments. Because to me, it's just something you want to get rid of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there's a, there's a. Um, uh, hey. Okay. Hey, hey. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, my question is, uh, is it a really the error, like single qubit, two qubit errors, a good quantity to see if we're progressing? For example, assume tomorrow we'll prove that if anything below 1% is, cannot be simulated by a classical device. It's not like we like win and if we reach like below 1%, we, we can relax and say we, we reach quantum supremacy. Um, it's a really kind of standard candle algorithm or problem which we really can look at every year and see if we make in real progress rather than just looking at the numbers about like single qubit or two qubit or circuit fidelity. Uh, yes, thank you. That's a great question. Um, how do I say this? There's a lot of fake news out there. Okay, and you know, someone might say, "Oh, our two qubit gates are our two qubit gate errors are really small, but they're the best of a big array or something." Okay, so you know, we need to know one and two qubit errors, and I need to know see this plot so I know what all 53 or all what n qubits are doing. That's the number one thing. What are they all doing? Not, I don't, I don't want to know the best number. Average is okay. Look, people have to report this in a better way. And then, you know, if you build a two qubit device, it's a lot easier to make your two qubit errors low. So what you have to, you know, it's fine to say I, I, I got that, but you have to build it in a big system. So basically, you have to, you have to report numbers in a big system where, you know, you're error budgeting everything, okay? And that's the only way you have a chance to know. Even then, you, you're not 100% you're not sure of what's going on, but, you know, then you have a chance to know. But I'm going to say for this, for one and two qubit errors, you see the whole array, and then if I want to know how, you know, how the whole system is working, I then look at the system fidelity, and I would say that the cross-entropy benchmarking is great for that. But, you know, for cross-entropy benchmarking, not a lot of groups have done that. The Chinese are notably benchmarking their systems that way, and that way I know what the heck they're doing. A lot of the other systems aren't doing that, and I have no idea what they're doing. And, you know, you have metrics like, um, um, you know, the quantum volume or something, which are nice, but I have no idea how that compares to their base results and when they're running a complex algorithm, how, how it happens. Now, it's a great metric, but I, I want to know, like, what's going on with the system. I'm just, you know, it, it's just people reported more that would be better. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a. Hello. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering what your viewpoint was on the state of progress in improving the error of these physical com uh, qubits in comparison to topological qubits, where the logical qubits don't suffer from the same kinds of physical errors. Okay. So I maybe didn't understand, but you know, the progress on making better qubits, Kevin will giving giving a talk later on in the week at Google. Uh, you know, I left Google two years ago. I think you'll, you'll see what the latest qubits are. The pro they made a lot of progress in making a more complex experiment. They still don't have very good T1s. But, you know, I'm sure that can get fixed. Compared to topological, oh, it's very easy to compare topological qubits because there are no topological qubits. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful people are looking at it. But come on, I'm an experimentalist. Maybe we have a the right way to stop. Yeah, right. It's maybe a good time to stop. Um, 
So uh, anyway, let's uh, thank John again.